This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10 day trial, visit lynda.com slash know how. That's L Y N D A dot com slash know how. And by Whole Home. Whole Home is more than a smart thermostat, it's a home energy controller that helps you save money and displays your energy use in real time. For a 30% discount, visit wholehome.com slash twit. Today on Know How, Pratt & Whitney's new super engine. Running Android on your Windows PC. How to protect yourself in the Googleverse. And your questions are answers. the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Balliser. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to take you through the projects that we've been geeking out to so you can take them home and geek out on your own. That's right. And uh, one of the things we like to geek out on this show is power. Power! And there's a new engine that uh, you were geeking out about. Yeah, new engine, but it's, it's weird because it's a new engine, but it's been under... Development for decades. It's an evolution. Yeah, it's one of these. Yeah. So it's a super simple idea, but it's taken a long time for us to finally get the technology to make it happen. Right. I, I think before we talk about that, we should probably talk about how Ooh. modern engines on like a, a passenger airliner work. The, they're actually yeah. turbofans. Mm -hmm. right? And that's something that's been around since like the what the Germans developed in World War II. Well, like, <laughs> they they developed jet engines, jet which engines. which is a little that's a jet turbine. And the idea behind a jet turbine is you have a container. Right, and you jam air on, in on one side, you compress it, you set fire to it with fuel, mm -hmm. it comes out the other side super hot, super fast, and you develop thrust, right? Right. Well, that works, and you get a lot of thrust, but it does tend to be a little bit wasteful. Right. So, a couple decades after the Germans developed that, we found that by fastening a big old fan, <laughs> yeah, it's just <laughs> really a fan, it's a yeah. propeller, a big propeller with a lot of blades, to the front of that turbine, you could generate a lot more power because you're you're, eventually, you're using that excess rotational energy right. to turn the fan, which acts like a propeller, which pulls air back, which creates thrust. Very smart. Very smart and actually kind of efficient. Yeah. I mean, when, when you look at that versus a jet engine, you get a lot more power per ounce of fuel that you squirt into the can. And that you know that's this is how a traditional turbo fan works. So uh, we got a, we have a video here that uh, Alex can play. Uh, this this is actually one of my favorite. This is the engine from a B1B, a Lancer bomber, and this is a it's an after burning engine. Uh, Ooh, quite nice, actually. I think there's sound of this, but uh, it's, it's probably pretty low. Now, now in this kind of an engine, you've got several parts. That thing at the front is the fan. Then you've got the low pressure compressor. Mm -hmm. Then the high pressure compressor. Then the combustion chamber. Then the high pressure turbine. Then the low pressure turbine. Hmm. Now, the nice thing is see, you get, it's color-coded, so the high-pressure parts are bonded together on a shaft, and the low-pressure parts plus the fan are bonded together on a shaft. The important thing to remember here is that that fan is going to turn at the same rotational velocity as both the low-pressure turbine and the low-pressure com uh, compressor, right? So those are all attached to the same shaft? They're right? all on the same shaft. And, and the reason why you want to do that is you don't want a whole lot of complexity inside of an engine. It's moving no. so fast that you add things that can break and they will break, <laughs> right? Right. Right. Well, now, here's the key on that, though. The power, the thrust that's coming through that turbine is going to turn that low pressure uh, 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 turbine towards the end, which will turn the fan, which gives you extra thrust. Right. Good idea, but we realized that there was a limitation of that a long, long time ago. And the limitation is essentially that you get far more energy, far more efficiency out of turning a large propeller more slowly than a right. small propeller really, really quickly. Just like when we're using our quadcopter props. Exactly. People always ask us, well, how, how do I get better flight well, or longer flight? Mm -hmm. Longer flight can always be achieved by using larger props. Larger props are always, always, always more efficient. We like small props because small props give us agility when we can go really fast, but there's a couple things wrong with them. One, the smaller the prop, the less efficient it's going to be, right? Because right. you have to spin it a lot faster to get the same amount of lift. The second problem is going to be they're noisy. Uh, you've, you've seen this. If, if any of you have flown a quadcopter, yeah. flying a small quadcopter 
always sounds a lot noisier than flying a big quadcopter. It sounds angry. It, it sounds, sounds like a bunch of bees coming at you. Right, because it's a higher pitched sound. It's a more annoying sound. Uh, so if you move to a larger prop, a more aggressive prop, mm -hmm. you can increase the efficiency. You could also lower the amount of noise. But the problem is you need more torque to turn it. That's why those engines that turn the big props, they spin more slowly because rather than spinning quickly, they just turn slowly but with more force behind it. Okay. All right. Okay. So the question is then, Brian, how do you take something like the fan on the front of a turboprop engine and spin it more slowly but with more power? Right, without you know too much complexity without yeah. too much complexity hmm. well the folks over at Pratt and Whitney figured it out this has actually been in development for 30 years it took wow. them 30 years and 10 billion dollars to figure out how to do this for the simple fact that anytime you put a gearbox into something that's that powerful that gearbox will tend to rip itself apart yeah definitely I mean they've had that issue with uh you know, big motors, just yeah. like, on cars and stuff like that. Well, think about the F-35. The F-35 has a big lift fan in the middle of it. Yeah. And that was the, the thing. It's like, wait a minute, how can you take thousands of horsepower from the jet turbine engine and funnel it into a, a propeller that's spinning this way? Yeah. You need, you need crazy material science, and you need really, really well-engineered parts. Well, Pratt & Whitney thinks they figured it out. In fact, they've created an engine that they say can give 16 percent uh, burn 16 percent less fuel for the same amount of thrust mm -hmm. that can put out like half the amount of nitrous oxides and pollutants because it's a more efficient burn right. and is also 75 percent more quiet when on the ground that's a huge difference it's a huge difference i mean it means that these planes can operate in places where they couldn't operate it means they save money on fuel and it also means that they don't pollute nearly as much right and then i guess uh over the 30 years, uh, 10 billion to make them work? 10 billion to make it work. And so is this, that maintenance costs and stuff like that? No, no, it just, that was just the development cost. That's just the That's development just, cost. Oh, wow. I'll just go ahead and run the second video. We actually show you here how this has worked. So that was a traditional engine. This is the new Pratt & Whitney. They're calling it the Pure Power. Hmm. There's a gearbox, so it's all the same parts, but you'll notice that the fan at the front is turning much more slowly than those low pressure parts, right? Yeah. And that's because there's that gearbox. It's an orbital gearbox that allows it to gear down that ratio. So as fast as the low pressure parts are spinning, the, the fan is spinning much more slowly, but with a lot more torque. That means you can use a more aggressive blade. It means you could use larger blades. It also means you can spin it at a much lower RPM and get more thrust. Ooh, yeah. that's what, pretty nifty. What a lot of people don't realize is that when we're dealing with a turboprop, uh, some, yeah, some of the thrust comes from that jet engine, from the turbine. Right. But actually more of it comes from the fan. <laughs> and that, so if you can figure out a way to more efficiently turn the fan, you're going to get a much more powerful engine. That's the pure power from Pratt and Whitney. That's pretty neat. Yeah, you can really see the difference there when they do the side by side. Oh yeah, yeah. Huh. Now, now that gearbox, it's 20 inches in diameter. It weighs 250 pounds, which is, again is incredible. When you think of how much energy needs to be channeled through that gearbox, and they say they say it can be as durable and reliable as a traditional engine. So I mean, the engineering that goes into something like that, it, just, it kind of boggles the mind. Yeah, what was, uh, there was a documentary that you linked a while back. It was Rolls-Royce, I think, and their development of their, uh, the blades in the jet, uh, in the fan. Yeah. And it was the work that went into just that. Yeah, just that. <laughs> Actually, uh, Virgil in the chat <laughs> room is saying, uh, you know, uh, increasing the bypass airflow makes the engine product more powerful. Yeah, a traditional mm -hmm. engine typically runs 5 to 1 bypass. This thing runs 12 to 1 bypass. I mean, it's... Wow. It, it, it's pretty good. Uh, I, I can't wait to see one of these in action. I, I do want to see what it does for noise levels because right. that's uh, I live near three airports and you always <laughs> hear them uh, you know I wonder how quickly airlines will adopt these yeah and then there's that other story that we had covered where uh, around the airport they had used the environment around right. the airport to kind of quiet things down if they had engines like this you might not even need to bother with that right right oh actually uh, Roebling is saying nine billion dollars for a gearbox can you say government <laughs> contract is it? yeah but you have to imagine the engineering that goes into this, it's, yeah. it's going to be used in more than just this. $10 this, billion dollars over 30 years. I think there's been $10 billion wasted yeah. much sooner yeah. on much this more year, frivolous things. Uh, in building a <laughs> Not by toilet. me, but... <laughs> no, I, I've wasted 10 billion. Uh, yeah, you know. It's, it's what I do. It goes really quick. Yeah, I know. Gosh, right? Uh, those yachts. I you think. spend a billion dollars and you just want to do it again. Well, yeah. <laughs> Go figure. I now, wish. When we come back... We got a little something something for you. We want to show you how you can run Android on your Windows PC. No, I'm not talking about some sort of emulation. I'm talking about running actual Android on your PC. 
kind of oh. kind of excited about this. Yeah, because there has been stuff that will do this in the past, but not not like this. Kind of not janky. as well. Yeah, yeah it was a little janky a little before. Janky side. This is less janky, and uh, we're going to show you where you can get it right now. So stay tab. But first, we do want to thank the first sponsor of this episode of Know How. Hey, Brian, let me ask you something. What's that? You know what the knowledge hole is? I do, and I, it needs to be filled. It needs to be filled. It's, <laughs> that, it's the part of your brain that just longs to have more information, right? Well, I show up every Thursday, and I'm just expecting, you just know, I'm in. ready. Just, just put fill, it in fill there. Up the knowledge hole. Mm -hmm. Well, here on Know How, we find no better place on the internet to fill that knowledge hole than lynda.com. Now, lynda.com is for the curious. It's for the problem solvers. It's for the people who want to learn new skills, who want to get things done. Oh, maybe you want to learn something about Excel, something yes. for your job. You could do that at Lynda. Maybe you want to learn a bit more about how to take better photographs for your hobby. Yes. You could do that at Lynda. Or maybe you just want to pad your job resume so that the next time you go job hunting, you have a couple of extra check marks that you can put <laughs> on that LinkedIn profile. Well, that's all at lynda.com. Now, with lynda.com, you get the best place, the repository of knowledge on the internet. You get to watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You get to stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule, including courses like After Effects, Up and Running with Premiere Elements 14, Up and Running with Photo Mag Magico, Music Production Secrets, and Up and Running with FL Studio 12. There's also Bert Monroy's weekly Pixel Playground series where Bert himself will walk you through a fun, self-contained Photoshop or Illustrator project. This is the way that you want to learn from people who actually do it in real life who are willing to show you the secrets that they've learned over the courses of their career. Uh, one of my favorite parts is that they have transcripts. So if, if there's a, a reference problem that you need answered, if there's one particular thing that you've forgotten about your Adobe Premiere training, well, you don't have to sit through all the training courses. You can look through the transcripts, find the exact point in the exact video that talks about it, and be solved. You get to take notes and refer to them later. You get to download the tutorials to your Android, to your iOS devices. You can watch on your Mac, your PC, your laptop, your desktop. You can share your playlist with friends as sort of a way to welcome them in to your knowledge hole. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try lynda.com. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one low flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash knowhow and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. And we thank lynda.com for their support of knowhow. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Do you like Android? I do like Android. I miss it. I haven't had an Android phone in a little while. I know. Well, because you broke it. You, yeah. You decided to use a submarine. <laughs> they, they should not have pockets on swim trunks. That was the problem. Yeah. That, I mean, that me that forgetting the, the phone yeah, was that, in my pocket was, was problem. probably part of the problem, yeah, too. Yeah. But what if I told you that you could have Android on your laptop or on your desktop? I would be interested. Would I would be interested? ask you, what, what would you do with Android on your laptop, Padre? Well, for me, I mean, because we have been talking about cheap tablets recently, right? Right. And these are nice, but they're kind of, they're one-use type things. In fact, this is a Nexus 7. This doesn't even really work it's anymore. It's forked now, it, yeah. Because it, it accidentally upgraded to <laughs> Android 5, which means it's useless now. Which is really sad. Which is really sad. So I got this, this Amazon Fire, which is decent. Yes. But, you know, it's a lower-powered device. It's a limited use case. It's kind of a limited use. You know, you, you like you, yes. you find one thing that it's really good at, and you, you do it. And I use the, that's the only thing I use it for. I, I do reading and watch videos on it. Well, I carry around my Windows laptop with me anywhere I go. It's, yeah. uh, I love this Acer S7. It's powerful. It's light. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's what I want in it's a laptop. It's a really nice piece of hardware. And sometimes I wish I could use my Android applications on my laptop. And right. now I can't. <laughs> Let me show you how. Now, this, this is actually something that was sent to us uh, by uh, an old schooler. Do you remember the company AMI? Uh, the BIOS? The BIOS company, yeah. yeah. Company. American Megatrends. Yeah. I remember seeing the logo pop up every time I turned on my computer. Exactly. Uh, American Megatrends is a company from way back in the day. Uh, if, if you ever assembled your own PC or if you bought a Dell back in the day, <laughs> yeah. you remember the AMI BIOS that would be the first thing that flashes on screen. Right. Uh, and it would say, okay, starting up. And it would do all the basic input-output instructions. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, AMI, they, they've moved on because we're kind of out of the, yeah. the generation of the BIOS. And they've decided that uh, they wanted to give us a virtual machine for Android. 
That's pretty cool. Well, there was BlueStacks, but that was always yeah. kind of iffy as far as hardware. Yeah, see, BlueStacks wasn't really a virtual machine. BlueStacks was an emulator for Android apps. Uh, so okay. they were Android apps that were running on top of your OS. Right. Uh, what what uh, AMI has decided to do is they've gone a completely different route. They've mm -hmm. said, no, 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 we don't want to make you an emulator. We want to give you a machine that can run inside your Windows box. And it is full on Android. It's, right. It will do everything Android will do and you don't have to worry about emulating a particular app. More importantly, unlike BlueStacks, it means you get complete access to all the hardware. And that's essential. Yeah, that, that is that's, absolutely essential. That makes way more sense to do it like that. Right. Because I, I tried BlueStacks and it was kind of, it was fun, right? Yeah, but then you get bored after a couple days. You would get bored, especially since, uh, like on mine, the audio did not work properly. Mm -hmm. It would just decide to Cylon every once in a while. I had no access to my networking devices. My USB was 50-50 whether or not it would work. Right. Uh, and, and also, it had no access to any of the sensors that were on my laptop. So the, it could not access the accelerometer, the tilt meter, the magnetometer, the camera. Yeah. What AMI has done is they've given us AMI du Duos, D-U-O-S, which okay. does access every bit of the hardware. And, and Alex, go ahead and show them that link because it, this, this is where we picked it up. There's two versions of this. There's the uh, Emmy Duos 2.0, which is Lollipop, and the Emmy Duos 1.1, which is Jelly Bean. Now, the Jelly Bean version is going to cost you $10, mm -hmm. and the Lollipop version is going to cost you $15, so you get to choose. Now, there's a 30-day free trial, so you don't got to buy it. You can but yeah, you test it out. Nice. Download it, and there you go, right? Now, That's awesome. It is kind of awesome. I, I will say, once you install you will have to install Google services because it is a complete version of Android, but... Uh, <laughs> right, but that's left out. Yeah, if anyone yeah. who's ever rooted their phone or... Knows does that something. you have to do that, yeah. right? And I also have to say, uh, there's there's going to be a couple of update cycles. So you, like, power down, it will update, and you power back up, it will update, power right. down, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and that's just because, it, like you said, it's like rooting your device. So you've just created a, a an image, a virtual machine image that's rooted, yeah. and now you have to add back in all the Google services that are not up to date. Right, right. Okay. Now let me show you how it works. Alex, go ahead and go to this computer. So this, this is my Windows laptop. Okay, so this mm -hmm. is this, this is our normal. display machine. This is normal, so this runs full on Windows 8, but I've uh, I've got this little icon here, DuoS, D-U-O-S, du mm -hmm. Dual OS, <laughs> Ami OS. They really have to work on the name for this. <laughs> but when you start this up, anyway, turn this back on, this is Android. So this is running a full on, this is as if it's running on my tablet. And as you can see, I haven't registered yet. I have, what, 28 days left. Uh, run my screen up. Now, the here's nice the cool thing. The nice thing about your laptop, too, is that it's a touch screen. It's touch screen. And this works perfectly with touch screen. So this, <laughs> this is not me on my mouse. This is me just swiping like I would on a standard Android device. I have access to everything I would have access to on my, my regular Android phone or my Android tablet. I will say there are a couple of things that are... Uh, slow, like as you can see, as mm -hmm. you can tell, this is running kind of slowly because it's got to go through Android. Sir, actually, I don't think I have an internet connection, so th this may take a while longer to load up. Uh, okay. There we go. See, it, uh, it's trying to fetch the information off the internet, it but is, it's not. Yeah, I'm connected up. really, really poorly. Hmm. But it is, it is accessing through the Wi-Fi of the laptop. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. There's That's no good. separate connector here, <laughs> so it, it is actually working. It's a little jank right now because I yeah. think I'm hooked up to the bad Wi-Fi signal. I forgot to put this back on production, uh, but. Again, I can load up most of my apps. It will tell me every mm -hmm. once in a while when an app is not compatible with this version. Okay. Um, also, I've noticed things like Photos, yeah. uh, the Google Photos. It takes for well, it's probably because I have like forty thousand photos in there, but it takes a really to long time that? to populate oh, okay. it. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm probably gonna just kick that off and let it run. <laughs> Overnight. So, can you have this pop up as like a Google device? Like, this is one of your devices, and you can do. We'll like... talk about that <laughs> later because there is a very interesting thing that happens with this. Huh. But I am signed in. So, I am signed in okay. as my Google account. Under now, your uh, Gmail. Uh, you'll notice, like down here. So, let's just press that. It's it's the standard icons. Uh, now, let's be honest. I can run all of my Google apps. Mm -hmm. But the apps I'm really concerned with are going to be my games. <laughs> the important which, stuff. The yeah. important stuff, uh, which is nice, because I'll be able to get this on the plane and, and play my my, uh, my Android games without having to do this with my phone. Right. Uh, Alex, if you show, this game controller is working just fine. So, you mean Alex's game controller? Oh, Alex you let me borrow oh, like a year ago and never gave never back, back to him? That's cool. Oh, that's, that's where it went. <laughs> no, that's not where it went. I mean, it's for the show. I knew we were going to use it for the show. What should we load? Oh, I know. 
Let's, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if this game supports uh, a, a game controller, but we're going to go and try it anyways. Mm -hmm. This is this is something I think everyone needs. None attack? None attack. Uh, everyone needs a none attack. <laughs> uh, That's too close to real life. Okay. I don't think that this is actually game controller enabled, but let's see. No, I have to show no. But see, look. look I, so I can play. My, I can go on and play my full game here. Oop, unless... Oh, I just did that. Uh-oh. Yeah. What did you do? Uh, so actually, I'm I'm, ha I'm glad that this happened because this does show there, there are still a couple of issues with this. This is what we we're trying to make happen. This well, no, but oh, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Hold on. If you if you leave it running for too long, uh -huh. it does tend to kind of bloat. So I've had this running for like since last night. Oh, okay. uh, it likes to be shut off when you're not using it because otherwise it's swapping in too much memory. I see. Yeah, uh, and also because I have the resolution turned all the way up because I was trying to make it crash. <laughs> Oops, my bad. Can you specify what, how much RAM and stuff, and like hard drive space and stuff uh, that you, you use can, for like a virtual don't, machine? Don't, no. no. Uh, let the virtual machine do it. Just I mean, do it. It, it will do what it needs to do. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing I, I really like about this is because of the fact that it's a virtual machine, it makes it a lot easier for me to move from from machine to machine to machine, keep right. all my data, keep my profile running. It also makes it really, really easy for me to do app development. Uh, I would much yeah. rather do app development on a device like this than a device like my Nexus 7 or, or my Amazon Fire tablet. Right, right. You know? And as you can see, it is running as a Windows device. Uh, so I like that. That is, yeah, that's pretty nice. It's not bad. It's, it's again, amiduos.com. Go ahead and download it. It's, it's, again, it's free for 30 days. Try it, see if it works for you. If, if it does, you know, 10 or $15, depending on if, if you want Jelly Bean or uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, honey? Like the, the, marshmallow? Mar no. Marshmallow is the newest one. No, the L, whatever lollipop. the L is. Lollipop. 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 Yeah, if, if you want Jelly Bean or Lollipop, mm -hmm. uh, get the version that works for you and try it off on your Windows device. Now, uh, so last night, uh, I had to answer the question, well, would, would this work on a Mac? It, there is no version for a Mac. But I did have Windows 7 running in parallels on a Mac, and then I ran this inside of that. Um, <laughs> it's like virtual machine inception. Don't do that. I do. I have Windows 10 on here on my Mac. So you could if you have like a full Windows 10 install. Uh, you could. Uh, don't do it. Don't, don't do it? Yeah, don't do it. I could do it. I mean, this isn't a touch screen, though. I'd be kind of disappointed about exactly. that. Exactly. But like Leo was running it on his Surface Book, and he had Fallout on that big screen, uh, Fallout Shelter. And I don't know if you played that, but it's like you really have to zoom in to see anything on yeah. that. It's perfect for that giant I, like tablet. Size. I will say, Leo made an exceptionally good point, which is when you run Android on a touchscreen enabled Windows PC, you realize how much better of a touch OS Android is than Windows. Yeah. I, and that makes me sad. It really makes me sad. But it's so true. I mean, uh, native Android apps to get touch so much better than anything on the Windows side. That makes sense, because they, they were made know. for from the ground up that way. A little bit of a bummer. I'm still upset about that. But it, you know what's cool is that you can do this on your Windows machine. You can. You can. All right, now, attached to this, so this is a nice little thing for you to download. We want to give you something practical. We know often we do impractical things here on Know How uh, that you're probably not going to do when you go home. But yeah. this is something you can do as soon as you finish watching the show. We did want to bring up a little something something, which I just found out that Leo covered last week, and it kind of bummed me out. Whoa, <laughs> what's that? Uh, it's uh, your privacy in the Googleverse. Right. A lot of people don't know exactly how much of the information is being stored in the Googleverse. I, I think a lot of people are aware that information is being stored, but they don't want to know. They don't want to know. Well, guess what? You're taking the blue pill. You're going down the hole. We're going to show you exactly oh, what's in there. All right, so uh, this, this is uh, a little something something. If you go to history.google.com, it's probably going to ask me. Are you me sure to, you want to show this? It's going to ask me to authenticate. I hope it asked me to authenticate. Oh, it didn't. Wow. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is something that is available to anybody who has a Google account. Uh -huh. And this shows you the bits of data, the metrics that Google has been storing on you. And as you can see, there's web and app activity. There's voice and audio activity, device information, location history, YouTube watch history, YouTube search history. It's pretty... Comprehensive. I mean, uh -huh. this is everything you do in the Googleverse. This right. is everything you watch, everything you click, everything you search for. Well, I remember uh, using OK Google. They save every every time you use OK Google. Yeah. And there, Jason Howell was showing off one time when he he set it off at home and he was just talking <gasps> and it had recorded oh. like everything in the background. It wasn't very close yeah. to what he had actually said, but oh. it was still had all the details. Exactly. That, we we will go through some of the more mundane stuff in a bit, but that's the one that a lot of people don't realize, which is when you say OK Google. 
Google or if you hit the microphone, that processing is actually not done on the phone. No. It's done on a remote server, which is why if you don't have connectivity, it Google will say, I can't contact myself right now. Right. Well, in order for that to work, it means that they get the audio file and then they turn it into text and then they send it back to you and your phone acts on it. Well, Alex, if you go here, I actually I have I probably should have scrubbed this before, but oh well. <laughs> okay, so if you go, uh, where, go, yeah, go, go to my before. screen on full side on full screen. So these are some of the uh, the the voice searches that I've done. I have no items today, but evidently yesterday, I was curious about how much radiation Lewis Slotkin received during his prompt criticality accident. He, <laughs> he was a physicist who okay. accidentally put two spheres of uh, was it, it was uranium together and exposed himself to a fatal dose of, ra dose of radiation. Ooh. Yeah, that was that was bad. Uh, I opened up maps. I uh, I opened up broke for free, covered in oil. That's that's the music I'm using for one of my new podcasts. Oh, okay. I set an alarm for 8:30. Uh, wait, and, and like, if I do this, <laughs> oh, wait, what's this? Can you can you play? Can you turn up the audio, Alex? We have gained the trust of Brian Burnett. And tomorrow we shall strike. Wait, what? I don't. Why do you have know, that? I don't know what that was all about, but that was <laughs> kind of weird. I was, yeah, you know, I feel a little wary now. <laughs> Thank you, Google. But but to this this is the sort of stuff that you know, a lot of people don't realize that is being stored inside your Google your Google profile. Right. Uh, and you can delete this all, but you you need to know that it's there. It's, there's no good in. No it's good, good to be aware of this. It is very good, actually. You know, some of this is really weird. Yeah, because that, that's like the example of Jason. Like it, it tries to guess what you're saying. Sometimes it's really not that. Good. You, know, you can also find out when Google is having difficulty understanding. Like for like this, send directions to 3601 Conan Drive, Dublin, California, and I, you know, it kept misunderstanding what I was saying, so I had to keep repeating myself. Uh. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure there's a couple of here that yeah. uh, if they're repeated, like I'm screaming at the phone, like that's not what I said, <gasps> Google. Damn it. <laughs> Defcon 19 badge. What's that all about? Directions? Ooh. And this goes, does this go way, how long do they hold on, how far back do they have it? Uh, you know, like I did not forever? check. I'm, I'm sure there's a privacy policy, but uh, I've gone back at least a couple of months and it's still in there. Right. Uh, so, yeah, this this could be kind of embarrassing, just, just FYI. And, hmm. and uh, this was supposed to verify me. It didn't. Well, was it because you're already signed in? Uh, well, it, I I thought I said it to verify e even though because what I don't want and this this is actually is someone something, sitting down on your computer. Or? Well, yeah, someone sits down on my computer. I haven't locked it. Yeah. They open up Chrome, which is already signed into me, and they put history.google.com. Now they have access to everything that I've done. Right. Even if you delete like the history and the cache from your browser, they still have access to this, which. Because that's, that's on Google server good. side. That's that's on the server side, right? Hmm. Now uh, we will, let me say this: you can delete all this. In fact, uh, in this in this thing, if there are a couple of things that you're a little wary about, you can go ahead and select them all, mm -hmm. and just have them deleted. There's a little delete button in the upper right hand corner, and just get rid of them all. They'll get wiped off the server, probably. Uh, yeah, probably, it's probably <laughs> not a backup. With quotation marks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now let's go to the more mundane stuff. There's the web and the web activity. So this is showing me. What's been going on in the web? So I visited, you know, Google.com. I visited. I visited Bing a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter, Docs, and it'll actually tell you which machine is doing it too. So this is all in PDISL, Padre SJ. Uh, again, this is this is what I use. I don't use history on my browser when I need to go back to something. You uh, use it's this. in here, right? Hmm. It's in here. Uh, the other thing that it'll do is it'll do location history. Although you'll notice. I turn this thing off. So even though it does have a location history function, uh, I shut mine off like two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. So this is only the locations that I, that it clocked me in uh, up to about three You're years ago. You're all over the place. Uh, well, I, I, I get paranoid, so I shut it off. This is oh. one of the very first things that I shut off. I could delete those locations, but yeah. I was like, eh, eh. This, eh. Hmm. who really cares? Yeah. What are the uh, pros, cons to all this, Padre? <laughs> uh, so. Because I mean, I, I'm one of these people who, I know I've put out so much information, you're not really going to decipher a lot about this that right. you don't already know about me. I do travel a lot, and I do search, and I do use Bing, and I use Twitter, and you, you're going to know the sites that I, I look for. Uh, my voice searches might find me a little irritated every once in a while, but you're not going to get a whole lot out of that. Or you're so, uh, planning my inevitable demise. I'm planning your inevitable demise. What it comes down to is how paranoid do you want to be? And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Some people will scrub every last ounce of data. Yeah. And if that's what you want, there is a setting here that you could turn all of this off. So right. if, if you go, oh gosh, this I really should have connected it to the other wireless. This thing is so slow. <laughs> I can turn everything off. Mm -hmm. So I can turn off 
of the uh, the browsing activity. I can turn. Uh, actually, go. Alex, go back here. I can turn off the search and uh, browsing history. I can turn off the places I go. That one is off. Information from my devices, my voice searches, my video searches, the videos that I watched. So I can I can basically shut Google out of everything. But mm -hmm. what I found is when I let Google have a little bit of information, it is it, able to. It gives me better searches. Yeah, I was going to say that's the downside. And also, it it makes uh, uh, Google now. It makes that actually work for me. Like right. it knows when I have a flight coming up, and it will remind me. Exactly. I don't even have to tell it to. So uh, I'm one of these people, I'm willing to trade a little bit of, of my information in order to have it. That convenience. That, that convenience, that feature. Yeah, I know Leo, he sounds like he's all in, though. He's like, he's all in. Ah, whatever. Yeah. Like, I'm not afraid of. Yeah. Well, but. it gets really hard to fight, because they're always finding ways to get a bit more, and then you have to shut off that control. And I have found, every once in a while, where mm -hmm. I've, I'll shut something off, and I come back three months later, and it's just mysteriously turned back on. That is a little... That, yeah. Mm, not a big mm, fan of that. Sketchy. A little on the sketch side. Uh, so, uh, do you mind if we look through your, your uh, Google history? Uh, maybe later, after I have gone through it real quick. Lots of Corgi <laughs> videos. <laughs> yeah, that's probably all there is on there. <laughs> Actually, I, I'm sure if, if you looked at mine, my YouTube uh, right now is like <laughs> poker videos and dog it, videos. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what have I watched? Let's see. This could be really bad. Uh, yeah. I know. Uh, okay. Uh, Actually... There we go. So I've uh, stupid drone <laughs> crashes. Want I wanted to hear a little, a little uh, Stravinsky. Oh, uh -huh. corgi. Aww. Corgi puppy. Oh, wow. I did do the corgi puppy thing. Yeah. Uh, airplane crashes, quadcopter crashes. Oh, the Reno race. That's right. I was looking that up at uh, 2.30 in the morning yesterday, <laughs> or this morning. Uh, going over screensavers, looking yep. for comments. Yeah, so, you know, no, no. probably nothing so bad. Oh, poker. I got really big into poker. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you've been staying up late watching poker now? I, oh, that's the other thing. Uh, when you, like, look through this, you realize how much of an insomniac you are. Yeah, when you look at the times. Mm. Well, that's what happens. You go down the rabbit hole, and then... I live down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, that's what we just did by yeah. learning all that stuff about Google. Well, when we come back, we've got a little treat for you. We've got, uh, we we want to show you what we think might be the future for people who are building quadcopters. No, 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 don't, don't, don't turn off. Even if you don't like quadcopters, you're going to like this because it'll make people fly more responsibly. And we also Good. have a question. We have a decent question from a member of the audience who's a little worried about power. Power? We like power. But before we go there, let's go ahead and thank the second sponsor of this episode of Know How. Hey, Brian, you yeah. know what I want? I want a smart home. I would love a smart home. I love smart homes. And you know what You know the core of a smart home is? The thermostat? Thermostat, efficient use of power. Yes. Yeah. That's what we're starting to realize, that when, you, when you're building out your smart area, your smart mm -hmm. home, your smart apartment, whatever it might be, the thermostat is one of the places where you can make the biggest impact. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. it controls one of the highest power drawing devices that you'll ever have, your air conditioning and your heating. Yeah. And the easier it is to monitor, it's a little bit more of a peace of mind because you don't know if you, yeah, when yeah. you don't have the knowledge. Who knows what's happening? Exactly. Oh, there are smart thermometers out there. There's plenty of them. And some of them are, are, are quite good. Mm -hmm. And they work the same way, which is they learn from you. So they look at how you want to set like the temperature. Like Google Now. Like Google Now. All right. The mm -hmm. more information it has about you, the more intelligently it can make decisions about when to turn on your heating or when to turn on your cooling. Right. Well, that's, that's what the whole home does. It's powered by Energate. It has one extra feature that I, that I really, really love, and that is the fact that Rather than showing you in sort of abstract mm -hmm. numbers what you might or might not be doing, this tells you in dollars. You see, there are, yeah. there are lights right here. And what this will allow you to do is at any point, you can take a glance over at the whole home and it will say, hey, uh, your power usage is pretty high. You're spending a lot of money. Yeah, or it will say you're super efficient right now. That hits home a lot more than uh, just numbers. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it, yeah. You put the dollar sign next uh, to it. What I was liking it to is it's like the, um, the, the meter, the, the screen that you get in a Prius. Mm -hmm. That thing has way more to do with how efficient you are than right. the car. The technology is good. But when people get feedback, real-time feedback on how they're using power, they're much more likely to save and be efficient. And change your habits. Exactly. That's what the whole home will allow you to do. Now, the whole home is its, it's the best way to give yourself a smart home. Like we said, it is the center of your connected kingdom. It's a home energy controller with built-in teaching and energy displays. It easily replaces your existing thermostat. It's, it's, it's really like a 10-minute installation, and it connects to your Wi-Fi using your smartphone. It also connects to a ZigBee-enabled smart meter. If, if you're one of those houses that has that, it's time to use it. 
Whole Home is easy to install, but and you can answer questions like, what time do you get up on a typical day for it to set up? It uses that to figure out when it should turn on your devices. Now, as soon as you install Whole Home, it will start minimizing your heating and your cooling costs, and will show you how much you're saving in both dollars and kilowatt hours. That's that immediate feedback that I've talked about. Its energy screen shows you your current electricity consumption and spending in dollars per hour. And just like that Prius screen, just like the speedometer, it will show you how much you're spending per kilowatt hour. So during the more uh, high demand times of the day, when you really don't want to have your appliances on, it will give you that visual warning of, hey, you know what? If you can hold off for a couple of hours, you'll get a much better deal, a much better ROI on energy spent. Oh, it's more than just a smart thermometer. What I found is whole home, it's a peace of mind. It's, it's a nice way to give people a great representation of not just how much energy they're using, not just how much money they're spending, but how efficient they're living. And when you give people that kind of information, well, they just make smarter choices. Well, we want you to try the whole home. Go ahead, save energy and money and see your energy use in real time. Go to wholehome.com twit to get your code and receive an exclusive 30% limited time discount. That's wholehome.com slash twit. H-O-L-H-O-M dot com slash twit. And we thank Whole Home for their support of know-how. Hey, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, you heard that story about those MIT students who figured out how to create like an autonomous flying machine, right? I did hear about that, yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting, and it's, it's all, none of it's pre-programmed. They actually created collision avoidance intelligence into the flight controller. So it used a camera to sort of veer right. away from objects. Telemetry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, one of the keys to doing that is to have sensors, have enough sensors on your quadcopter so that it can make intelligent decisions mm -hmm. even when you're making stupid ones. <laughs> right, kind of like a safety net. Kind of like a safety or like a Tesla's autopilot. Right? Exactly. You know, still have you in control, but have the quadcopter smart enough so that if you're doing something that's going to endanger the quadcopter or people around the quadcopter, it will just say, no, 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 I'm going to go back to a safe, uh, a safe default. I'm going to rise a little bit or right. lower a little bit and, and get out of the way. Especially with quads, because uh, people get into trouble with these pretty easily. So it's nice to incorporate something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why I'm glad we stopped by Interdrone and we had a chance to check out Lightware. They've created a sensor for people who want to give their quadcopter some quad smarts. In order to grow the field of quadcopters, we need to work on their brains. Of course, brain power is great, but it doesn't do much without senses. Now, accelerometers may work well, but if you need real precision, you need lasers, which is why I'm speaking with James Portman here at Lightwear, who's going to explain why your next quadcopter might be ex equipped with beams of light. James, why do I need lasers? You know, the issue with most sensors on a quadcopter right now is that they're internal to the quadcopter. In other words, they measure what's going on inside the quadcopter itself. The question is, what's going on outside? Are you going to run into somebody? Are you going to hit a tree? Are you going to hit a power line? And the only way you can do that is to have outwards looking sensors. And laser is the way to go with that. It's the only thing that's fast enough, accurate enough, and provides enough detail to allow you to do something like sense and avoid, which of course is going to become really critical to the whole drone industry. GPS and accelerometers may do well if it's out in the open field, but if I'm going to operate it inside tight quarters, it has to be aware. So tell me, what technologies do you have here at this booth that allow me to give my drone eyes? Well, the first thing you want to do is, is don't fly into the ground. Um, this, that might sound really simple, but the problem with the onboard sensors is that they rely on things like barometric pressure, which of course is a height above sea level. It's not a height above ground level. So if you're landing in an area where you're unfamiliar with it, you don't know exactly how high the ground is, you could just fly your very expensive quadcopter into the floor. So you can think of that as stage one. But the issue then becomes one of safety. If you want to fly beyond line of sight, especially for a commercial drone operator where that is critical to their business model, you have to have some sensory capacity that goes beyond just looking down at the floor. You have to start looking outwards. So what we've developed is some extremely high speed laser technology that can measure 36,000 points per second. And this gives the drone the capacity to look in many different directions almost simultaneously because there's so much data. And that means it can find a power line or a lamp post or a, or a pylon or more importantly an individual or a person who's in a landing area where you didn't expect it. 
Oh, I, I do want to take a look at some of the technology. If you look up here, this sensor right now is actually measuring exactly how high this drone is off the ground. Uh, if you go ahead and look down at this monitor over uh, right below it, you can see as I move my hand up and down, it's giving me a real time and a real precise view of how much space there is between the drone and my hand. That would allow me to do some terrain following techniques built into my flight controller. Now, of course, as, as James mentioned, being above ground is one thing, but also being aware of your surroundings is the other. That's where this comes into play. See this little rotating disc? That's, that's not just for fun. That actually shows you exactly what's around. If you, again, look at the monitor down below the drone, you can see that as I move my hand around, it actually picks up exactly what is near it uh, and, uh, and what might come into conflict with its flight path. This is the kind of sensor that we're going to need if we want to grow our drones past a hobby or a prosumer market. Now, James, the big question is going to be, how much do these weigh and how much do they cost? Well, on the uh, on the laser altimeters, the small products, uh, they weigh about 31 grams and prices run from about $250 upwards depending on the performance. But we think that the real challenge is in the sense and avoid market. So there what we've tried to do is we've tried to create uh, an absolute almost military grade scanning system but for less than $1,000. So we're looking at retail price at the moment of around $900, but what we're hoping is that in the future, we'll be able to bring those prices down as demand increases. James, this is fantastic. This is phenomenal. This is technology that would have cost multiple thousands of dollars just a year or two ago. The fact that you're bringing it down to a price point that they can afford, that they can tinker with, I love it. Now, could you please tell them if they want to find out more about your technology, more about Lightware, where can they go? Our website is www.lightware.co.za. Up all the rubber ballast there in the future is freaking lasers. I, I wouldn't use that technology on my racing quadcopter because it doesn't make sense. Right. But, right. but you know, like the, the bigger ones that I build for aerial photography, that might be kind of nice. That would be really nice, yeah. It, uh, I'm sure there's a few people in our Google Plus group that would appreciate that when uh, they're in a giant <laughs> field and the only thing they want to avoid is the giant the light pole. pole. And they hit it. And of yeah. course, yeah, they go straight into it. Yeah. And it, it really does work. I mean, it's proven technology and the fact that they're bringing it down to that a decent price point. In fact, by, by next year, Kits like that are going to run $150, $200. That's pretty impressive. I mean, the thing that sat on top of the quad definitely looked just like it the does. things that are on, um, like, the Google the automated things, vehicles yeah. and yeah. stuff. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good thing to have on there, especially for somebody like me who uh, tends to panic when they get next to a building or something like that. It's just like, ah, or if somebody's new to flying and they let go, go of the controls or All the right. wind takes it. I, I will say, if you look at that video again, there's a Raspberry Pi that's fastened underneath. I so saw that's that. doing the processing. After it gets the sensing, it decides what the, the flight controller should do. Right, because uh -huh. yeah, the biggest uh, hampering is going to be the weight and the uh, how much battery power it sucks up that's already like being used for the drone. But right. Right. pretty cool. Now, we've got a, actually a really good question. It is, he is asking specifically about quadcopters, but it's not just quadcopters. This is a basic question about electronics and power draw. If you're building anything and you need to figure out how much power you're going to be using and how big of a battery you need, right. then you're going to want to listen to this feedback because it's all about how math is hard. <laughs> math is hard. And this comes from T. Raburn. And he is asking, I'm finally rebuilding my quad and I'm using an RTF 2208 2300 KV motors with a Rotor, Rotor Geeks RG20 20 amp ESC. I'm planning to get a 2200 MAH uh, 4S battery to keep from overloading the ESCs. Mm -hmm. What C rating 4S battery should I get? If my calculations are correct, anything over 10C would overload the ESCs anyway. That doesn't seem right. Am I using the wrong equations? Mm. Answers? Yes. 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 <laughs> I was going to say, let's use the chalkboard. <laughs> let's use the chalkboard, Johnny. No, okay. <laughs> uh, actually, we get this question a lot. And again, it's not just for quadcopters. Anytime you're, you're creating an electrical device that you want a battery power, there's a couple of bi bits of information you need to know. You need to know how much is it going to draw. So whatever you're creating, how much power does it need on a continuous basis? Mm -hmm. You'll also need to know max and min. So if you have a device that will have wildly varying maximum, maximum and minimum draws, right. you need to account for that inside of your, your build. You're also going to need to know how long do you want to run it because that will determine what size of battery you need and also how you want to balance the volts slash the current. 
Right. Okay, so, and we'll talk about what all that means in a bit. Let's talk about power for this specific case. <laughs> uh, now, we've, we've got, uh, we know that motors are typically rated for watts. Right. So that's which how much total power they're going to be using. Right. Times we, amps. Volts times amps. So, uh, remember, West Virginia. West Virginia. <laughs> w equals V times A. Watts is equal to volts times amps. That is an equation that you will use all the time whenever you're building anything electric. West Virginia. Okay. West Virginia. Good to yeah. know. So motors are going to be rated in watts. Uh, and typically, they also tell you how many volts they can handle. Mm -hmm. And then ESCs are typically rated in amps, how much current they can pass through. Okay. Now, we know if, if you... Again, this is math. <laughs> since w, w equals VA, so it's since watts equals volts times amps, if I want to increase the amount of watts I have, mm -hmm. I can either increase the amps or I can increase the volts. I increase either of those, it's going to increase the watts, right? Right. Which also, by, by correlation, means if I have a device that can only handle so many amps but can handle higher voltage, I can get the same amount of watts as something that can only handle a very low voltage but high amps. Right, okay. Right, so just imagine that. Does it, the, keep that in the back of your mind. Now in this particular case, Alex, go ahead and go to this, go to this link. He's talking about a ready-to-fly quads 2208, 2300 kV motor. Mm -hmm. This thing is rated for a maximum, the most it will ever draw, mm -hmm. which read it as, if it draws more than this, you just blew up the motor. <laughs> 295 watts. Okay. That is its max, max draw. This also tells us that it can handle up to a 4S battery. That's 14.8 volts. Again, we know watts equals volts times amps. So at 295 watts, 14.8 volts, it means it's going to pull 19.934 amps of current. Okay. Whew. Makes sense, right? Math. Yes, it, it does make again, sense. Again. Well, so again, watts equals volts times amps. Mm -hmm. So if I have uh, 295 watts, that is equal to 14.8 volts times X. Divide both sides by 14.8, so 295 divided by 14.8 equals 19.934. Trust yeah, me, me, maths is I was hard. was riding it in the air and it just yeah, it dissolved. <laughs> okay, but no, it is 19.34 uh, amps. Mm -hmm. So if you've got an ESC that can handle 20 amps, you've got it covered. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at the ESC. And Alex, you've got another link here. This is the ESC that he wants to, to use, the Rotor Geeks RG20 ESC. Uh, he says that this can handle 20 amps. Okay. Um, and it's, the description on this is not great, but it looks like it can handle at least 14.8 volts. Hmm. My guess it could handle even higher. Now, it doesn't look like it has a lot of cooling on it. It doesn't have a lot of cooling. It's actually designed to be uh, very uh, kind light. of, uh, you can enclose this. It, uh. it really doesn't take a whole lot of cooling. It's actually a very well designed device. Hmm. But this will be able to handle the 20 amps. Uh, even if it couldn't, though, since I can run higher voltage on this, if, if I, if let's say my current was going to be 24 amps, if I had the ability, as I do on that ESC, to run it at, say, a 6S battery, mm -hmm. which is more voltage, I could actually get it down below the current maximum by increasing the voltage. Remember how I said I could, those are right. kind of interchangeable? Mm -hmm. So that's, okay. That, Actually, I probably went off the rails there. I probably just confused a bunch of people. Just You're melting faces I'm melting right faces. Now. So let's, let's get back to this. He wants to know yeah. how, much, how big of a battery he's going to need. Right. And he was wondering if he was using the wrong equations. And was he? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> and we're done. We know, we know that we've got four motors, mm -hmm. four 2208 motors that are going to pull 295 watts each. each. Okay. okay. We also know that that's 1180 watts of continuous power at its maximum. So I need a battery that can deliver 1180 at its maximum. Right. Okay. That's what's called the discharge rate, the C rating. That's mm -hmm. that, uh, like, if, uh, let's go to the overhead. If you look at all these batteries, they all have, like, this is a uh, 5,000 milliamp hour. It's a 4S, so that's 14.8 volt. 20 to 30C. 20 to 30C. This one is, where is that? Uh, Ooh, 25C. This one is 60C. So these are different discharge ratings. The discharge rating only means how quickly can this battery supply the power that's contained within the chemistry. Right, right. So the higher the C rating, the faster it can push that power out. If you, if you draw power beyond the discharge rate of that battery, you will destroy the battery. Right. That's when you puff it up. Right? And that's bad. That leads to that's, bad things. That leads to bad things. That leads to fires and crashes, and we don't like that. No. Uh, now, uh, that C rating, it, it, it's a slightly modified formula, but it's still West Virginia. Okay. Okay, so if I need to know how much instant power my battery can provide, it's watts 
equals volts and volts times amps times amps times the C rating. Okay. Okay. So I'm adding the C rating, and that gives me the instantaneous discharge. Right. So for example, uh, th this this actually is a really good example. We've got this small one here. So this is a this is a 4S. So this is a 14.8 volt battery. It's 1,000 milliamp hours, which means one amp. Mm -hmm. That's milliamp hours. So 14.8 volts. One amp, 25C. So times 25. So it, yeah, it'd be watts. So the instant, uh, the amount of instant watts, the amount of discharge power I can get out of this is equal to 14.8 times one, times 25. So 14.8 times. Times one, times 25. Right. Because that's a discharge rating, and that gives me 370 watts. So okay. I know at any given time I can get 370 watts out of this safely. That could power one motor. <laughs> okay, we obviously we're gonna need more. One, one motor at max. At max throttle. Right. Uh, okay. So we we're gonna need more than that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move over to this. So this is a. Uh, actually, if you zoom in, Bigger this is, is a 4S 2200 milliamp hour 60C battery. So this would be 14.8 volts times 2.2. 2. 2.2. 2.2. Right. 2.2 uh, times 60. Okay. Okay. And that gives me 1953.6 watts. Okay. Yay! <laughs> right. Okay. We're learning. We're learning. So, it, but here, here's the here's the thing. If I want to increase the amount of discharge power I can get out of my battery, mm -hmm. either I can buy a higher C-rated battery, so a higher discharge rating, mm -hmm. or I can buy a battery that has more amps. Uh, I see. Uh, yeah. Either of those will increase the amount of available power at any given rate. So, what's the amps on this one? So uh, this is a five amp. So this, this has way more power than this. This is more than double the amount of available power as this cell, mm -hmm. but this discharge rating is way lower. It's about 25C. Right. So 25C, it's less than half of this, but this has more than half, uh, more than double the capacity. So this one can actually provide 1,850 watts, actually less power than this can put out. Uh, weight's starting to become a factor at weight's, this point. Weight's starting to become a factor. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I know this is a lot of math, but I, I gotta drill this. Just remember, West Virginia, West Virginia, West Virginia. <laughs> Just keep that in your mind, and that's gonna get you through most of, uh, of your design problems. Again, okay. this is for quadcopters, so he wants to know instantaneous draw. But if you are designing like a Raspberry Pi that you want to run over a long amount of time, right. you need to know this, because a Raspberry Pi is gonna pull one amp, five watts. Yeah. Okay. So five, sorry, five volts. Five volts, five volts yeah. one amp, which mm -hmm. is five watts. So it's going to pull a continuous five watts of power, which means your power system is going to be, be able to support that for as long as you want to run it. Right. Then you can figure out yeah, how long it'll be. Right. If I that. pull five watts an hour and I have a battery that can apply you can uh, estimate 20 watts, the... it's running four hours. Cool. Okay. So uh, have I, we've totally confused the audience, haven't we? No, well, yes. You, yes, you have. Are we going to have the m math in the show notes? The maths. The yeah, math it's, it's all in the show notes. Okay, so. so yeah, definitely check out the show notes. I'm going to need to think of this equation because I wanted to do a Raspberry Pi uh, remote camera and it'd be battery powered, and I wanted to know how long, like a little... Yeah. Like I plant it somewhere, and mm -hmm. I need to know when I need to come back in for it. In fact, great idea. Hey, hmm? geeks, get into the Google Plus group and give us your power equations. I know you all want to do things like running cameras and running uh -huh. Raspberry Pis. Show us that you have a firm grasp of West Virginia. <laughs> West Virginia. And you can calculate how much of a run time you can get off of a battery for a particular device that you're building. Show us on the map where West Virginia is. Show us on the, actually. Do you think you could find it? <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. all this, if you look over, like, when you fly, the state's yeah. names are actually written. Oh, okay. Yes. I just need to fly more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right. We know that this has been a lot of information. We're going to make sure all of this ends up in the show notes. We did want to end, because I know to, I, yeah. people who don't like quadcopters, I understand. We haven't covered quadcopters for, for more than six weeks. So, and this wasn't a build. This mm -hmm. was just talking about it. You're learning. There's, well, West oh. Virginia. Oh, jeez. Uh? <laughs> We're good at wait, the math. No, wait, 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 wait. No, I don't. No. No. No? No. Alex, can you put one with names on it? It's it's West Virginia, it's West. so it's got to be on this side, right? I, I, I don't know. I'm kidding. I'm bad. <laughs> okay. No. Oh. We just got asked by a TD. Uh, we did want to give you a little something, something. So people who, who don't like the quadcopter builds, here's something for your dreams. Now, Imagine this. Alex, go ahead and start playing it. You're, you're flying. Mm -hmm. you're, you're getting some beautiful mm -hmm. imagery. 
you're, you're like all happy. You're yeah, like, oh, look at this. This is, this is kind of peaceful. Oh. And uh, and then suddenly, what is that? Oh my God, is that a pumpkin? Ah! What the? Yeah. That came out of nowhere. <laughs> okay. This is a video that's making the rounds on YouTube right now. This is a guy who was flying his drone. That is a one of those pumpkin cannons Whoa. for pumpkin chunking. And it was a one in a million shot. He just happened to be exactly in the line of fire. Was it, he filming? Trying to film that? Is he that was trying he was to film there? something. Uh, and uh, the funny part, if you if you look at the comments on this video, around 30 seconds, there's something that looks like a man, but might not be a man. People are like, is it Slender Man? You know? <laughs> is it just say an artifact of nature? What? So, uh, folks, if you uh, if you love shot. quadcopters, that's a great shot. And if you hate quadcopters, that's a great shot. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, the anti-quadcopter system. Is it fires pumpkins at drones that you want it to go away? Know how. We give a little something for everyone. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, don't forget that if you need our show notes, you can find them on our show page. Uh, where do they go for that, Brian? Twit.tv slash KH. That's uh, where you can find all our past episodes. And if you want to know the math, you're going to have to check out today's episode's uh, show notes. And you can uh, check out one of the handy links to download and subscribe also. Yeah, yeah. And also, please, please join us on our Google Plus group. We're at like 9,300 members. Over 9,000. It, it's, it's active. It is one of the most active groups that we've got here on the Twit TV network. And that's because people like to post their projects. And we, by the way, we've seen your project. We will be incorporating more and more of those into our show because you've got some great stuff out there. If you make, if you like to DIY, or if you have questions, that's the group you need to belong to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And don't forget, that's not the only place you're going to find us on the socials. No, if you want to get a behind-the-scenes look at what we might be coming up with next week or, uh, I don't know, what we do outside of know-how sometimes. I don't do anything outside <laughs> yeah, of Yeah, very rarely. Mm -hmm. uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Crinky underscore Hippo. And find me at Padre SJ. And we got one other person, right? He's like, no. what, one Excuse hand. me, Padre. Uh, what? I think I found the picture of Slender Man. <gasps> yeah, oh my gosh. Whoa. Oh, you know what? You've only got seven days, and then you're going to die. But I think I'm conflating. We just my, killed uh, the whole my horror story. <laughs> That's creepy. It's kind of creepy, right? It's it's an artifact. The is it spinning. an artifact? It is probably. You're probably all gonna die. Uh, also, don't forget our uh, our director, Mr. Uh, Hal. 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 Alex. 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 Excuse me. Brian, that's hmm? Alex. Alex. Oh. Alex Gumpel. Oh. You're going to find him at NL3. That's A N E L F3. Mm -hmm. He's the guy who pushes our buttons. He I makes sure that we stay I think he's new. Time. He's, he's kind of new. new. Yeah. Well, because the last guy you killed. <laughs> right. They can't arm. prove that. No. They can't prove that. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here. Yeah, I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go shoot a pumpkin at it. Go do the maths. Do the maths. Math is hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually Jesus maths. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>